The Star Wars universe is a pretty complex place, and it gets a little more complex with every episode of Rebels, every tie-in comic and novel, and best of all, when a highly continuity-dependent movie like Rogue One is released. Every tenuous connection makes the experience a little richer, no matter how hard the director tries to hide these things in the fabric of the film. Here are a few Rogue One easter eggs you didn't notice. Oh, and if you haven't seen Rogue One yet, brace for impact, spoilers ahead. Blue Harvest What is it with young rebels and blue milk? As a very young Jin escapes her family's farm at the beginning of Rogue One, we see a glass of blue milk perched on a countertop, not unlike the questionable beverage that young Luke Skywalker had to endure in A New Hope. The blue moo juice also appears in Attack of the Clones. Presumably, the junk comes from banthas, but no one is free from it, even on planets where banthas aren't a native species. Someone is importing this junk. Forget about building a Death Star, just corner the blue milk market if you want to conquer the galaxy. Where there's a will? Back when Star Wars was just a shadow of an idea in the curly head of George Lucas, it was called Journal of the Wills. The concept of an ancient race of aliens deeply connected to the Force has floated around the Star Wars universe since the beginning. But nothing really definitive has been established about them, except for that they absolutely have nothing to do with Yoda's unknown species. Lo and behold, the desert city of Jeddah was actually home to the Temple of the Wills. Once guarded by the blind Chirrut Imwe and freelance assassin Baze Malbus, the bustling mysterious city has super deep ties to the whole Jedi thing, which is reinforced by the fallen Jedi statues around the surface, and the fact that it's absolutely full of kyber crystals, used to make lightsabers. Jeddah? Jedi? It can't be a coincidence. And now it's exploded. The not-so-good Doctor It's a cameo that's impossible to miss. In the ill-fated city of Jeddah, Jin Erso and Cassian Andor bump into a really, really ugly man and his walrus face pal. Visitors to Shalman's Cantina on Tatooine will easily recognize the duo as Dr. Everzin and Ponda Boba, who tried to start trouble with Luke Skywalker and lose an arm to Obi-Wan's saber. Apparently, Ponda Boba could easily escape a city going totally nuclear, but couldn't keep his arms from falling off his body in a sleazy bar a few weeks later. Tough break, buddy. The worst job in the universe. Directing the as-yet-entitled Star Wars Episode 8 would be a dream job for just about any director. And as you probably know, Ryan Johnson scored the gig after directing a few episodes of Breaking Bad and writing the screenplay for Episode 8. But he also got the absolute worst gig in the galaxy, standing next to the deadly, planet-destroying, railingless laser shaft in the Death Star. I just want a railing. You know, one railing, right here. Yeah, I know. I've almost fallen over that thing so many times. It's a cameo we wouldn't even know about if Johnson didn't tell us the 2016 Star Wars celebration in London. So let us not forget that not only did Galen Erso build a vulnerable exhaust port into the Death Star, but he subtly made these guys' lives a living hell. For the rebellion! Budget Dedrick and Cave Monsters There are a lot of scummy things going on in Saw Gerrero's ramshackle base, including, but not limited to, watching weird hollow porn of dancing Twi'leks, which only reminds us of Grandpa Ritchie's dirty dalliances in the Forbidden Star Wars Holiday Special. Oh, oh, we are excited, aren't we? But amid the many props and baubles found in the base is a very bootleg version of Dedrick the holographic chess game found aboard the Millennium Falcon. This dollar store version uses actual physical pieces and not the high-tech animated holographic stuff, which is what you get when you blow your whole hologram budget on dancing girls. Also making an appearance in Guerrera's cave in especially easter eggy form are creatures from director Gareth Edwards' 2010 film Monsters and his 2014 film Godzilla. The director told the Star Wars show that it wasn't even him being cheeky. These were slipped into Guerrero's cave by the crew. Like father, like son. Like all good supervillains, Darth Vader has to have a sweet and scary base. We've only really seen him hanging out on giant starships, but early concepts for the character place him in his very own Snake Mountain, by the name of Bast Castle, on the beaches of an acid rain planet called Vajun, where real estate is probably cheaper than Detroit. While Rogue One flips the script a bit, and thankfully his base doesn't just look like a giant version of his own helmet, because that design was stolen by the Legion of Doom, Vader apparently chills on a fiery lava planet, which is presumably Mustafar, the very same place he lost most of his body parts and caught on on fire courtesy of Obi-Wan Kenobi, because there's nothing like building a home on the shores of the lake where your humanity and dignity drowned. 
And of course, Vader has to take his cumbersome costume off occasionally, right? We learn that in order to rejuvenate his half-robot body, he goes swimming in his own personal Bacta tank. Extremely similar to the one we see Luke in, recovering from frostbite and some serious Wampa wounds. Though a sassy Wampa slap is a lot less serious than, you know, losing all your limbs. The Rebels Connection Early intel for Rogue One was adamant about the film having nothing to do with the ongoing animated series Rebels, but now that seems like a bit of a misdirection, for a few reasons. First, it looks a lot like the Rebel ship Ghost is spotted among the fighters during the film's final battle, indicated by the unique pattern of lights on the rear of the ship. There aren't too many ship's butts that look like a surprise clown, but the Ghost is one of them. Second, the name General Sinjula is mentioned, and unless Sinjula is the Jones or Smith of the galaxy, that would have to be Hera Sinjula the captain of the Ghost. Some viewers have also speculated on the use of the name Black Saber as one of the Empire's projects. Mentioned as Jin is searching the archives and just before she lands on the file she's searching for, Stardust. While there are a lot of sabers in the universe, the Dark Saber is an ancient Jedi artifact once stolen by the Mandalorians and then wielded by Darth Maul. And yes, it has a black blade. Black Saber could refer to just about anything though. From Darth Vader's tarrowing, hellish home, to an undisclosed death weapon, to Grand Moff Tarkin's favorite pie recipe, time will tell. Blasting Womp Rats Luke Skywalker, even though he'd one day become a noble Jedi, was a jerk of a kid. To quash his boredom on Tatooine, he'd hop into his T-16 Skyhopper and fly around blasting Womp Rats. Apparently, his love of fun is shared by Stormtroopers too, since two helmet heads can be heard on Scarif idly chattering about how the old T-50 models were getting phased out. Do Stormtroopers go on joyrides? Or is it just an endless nightmare of anxiety until a rebel blows you up? Or a slightly perturbed Darth Vader crushes your wind? pipe. We hope it's the former. Red 5 the Rebel Alliance existed long before a shaggy-haired farm boy turned Jedi came along to save it. While Luke was out collecting moisture in the desert and whining about not going to Tashi Station, a real Rebel soldier was flying around in an X-Wing with the call sign Red 5, until he exploded during the attack on Scarif. A little while later, Luke would take the same call sign during the Battle of Yavin, destroying the first Death Star, since, you know, no one was using it anymore. But he wasn't the only hotshot pilot, and he wasn't even the boss. The head of the Red Squadron, Garvin Drays, survived the attack on Scarif, and went on to attack the Death Star at the Battle of Yavin. Original actor Drew Henley came back to play the role, at least via some amazing CGI work. Since Henley was 76 at the time, and passed away 10 months before the film reached theaters, he can consider himself in some pretty solid posthumous company. Thanks for watching! Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.